Hello everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of our Below the Radar conversation series. Today we talk with Megan Chumat, clinical scientist at the Center for Gendered and Sexual Health Equality and clinical associate professor at UBC School of Nursing. With our host, Am Johal, she discusses her previous international work studying and combating pandemics and how this has informed her current understanding of COVID-19, both internationally and locally here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Enjoy. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to uh, Below the Radar. We're lucky to have our uh, guest, uh, Megan Tumath, here with us. I'm probably completely destroying your last name, Megan Tumath. Tumath. He's a former neighbor of mine who lived across the alley uh, from me. But Megan, uh, would you be able to introduce yourself? Great. Thanks very much, Am. Really great to catch up. So I'm Megan Chumath, and uh, I'm a clinical scientist with the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity, uh, which is out of Providence Healthcare and UBC. And I'm also a clinical associate professor at the um, School of Nursing with the uh, University of British Columbia as well, UBC. Great. You know, I think uh, along with uh, pretty much everyone in the world, we're going through varying degrees of anxiety with uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19. And uh, as someone like you who have uh, not only studied pandemics, but you've uh, uh, in many parts of the world also uh, uh, traveled and um, uh, were uh, on, the, on the front lines of, of pandemics before. So before COVID-19 uh, hit, what has your, been your uh, experience working internationally? Yeah, I've been um, very blessed as a registered nurse. I don't know if that's my feedback or yours. Anyways, start again. I've been very blessed as a registered nurse and a sort of public health practitioner to work. Um, initially started working in global health in Haiti, mainly in HIV AIDS, which has been the bulk of my expertise, sort of at the intersection of um, HIV and human rights. And so focusing mostly on um, infectious diseases among people who use drugs, sex workers, LGBT community members, and figuring out how we can, um, using a human rights lens, uh, really prevent HIV, but also um, get, get treatment to folks so that we didn't see this um, really, really vastly um, and disturbing um, inequities among um, mortality for people who use drugs in particular. And so that, that work um, led me to lots of different um, work with the Global Fund and AIDS, TB and malaria. I think lost count at maybe like probably 36 different countries had the privilege to work with primarily around their Global Fund grant implementation uh, for what, we, what in HIV we call key populations. And uh, that would often be, you know, as a technical advisor for UNAIDS or United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Um, and then more recently worked with the World Health Organization on Ebola in the DRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that was in October um, where I got to work on infection prevention and control, um, mainly as an evaluator, but also um, capacity building among local health systems on a really interesting project for youth. Um, it was primarily youth who were involved in sort of the resistance um, around the, the uh, outbreak of Ebola at the time in, in West Africa, as well as working with um, medical students and helping them to build capacity of local clinics because they were sort of a, a resource that wasn't already being de well deployed. And then uh, from there, um, I also have worked a little bit with WHO Afro, WHO Afro on COVID-19 preparedness, as well as the Red Cross. Um, the Canadian Red Cross really unusually um, put out a call to their international de delegates on one of the, on their emergency response team. Um, and it was the first time I got a call from them. Usually it's, it's, you know, can you go to this cholera outbreak in this place? But it was actually, can you go to Trenton, Ontario? <laughs> And many of us uh, from the IO team were like, why are we being deployed in our own country? And it was actually the first time the Red Cross has ever um, deployed international delegates to a response. So that's where I was in February, um, working with Wuhan evacuees and evacuees from some of the cruise ships uh, in Canada's first large quarantine zone. Um, I think it's the largest ever quarantine operation that we've had. And that was to bring home those Canadians that were uh, stuck in Wuhan. In terms of in, in relation to uh, more recent uh, pandemics uh, in terms of global health system, what are some uh, 
uh, characteristics or features of COVID-19 that place uh, particular challenges around uh, uh, health system responses, be they globally, nationally, uh, locally, you know, you having uh, dealt with others in, in the context that you just uh, described, obviously there's the uh, the spread, the rapidity of it, and, and there's particular challenges and, and features that it poses that makes this perhaps uh, a lot more complicated than other more recent uh, mm -hmm. pandemics that we've had. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the difficulties is is the asymptomatic transmission. I mean, with Ebola, one of the good and the bad things is you're you're quite unlikely to transmit when you not don't have symptoms, and it, and the mortality rate is so high, the attack rate in Ebola that that's both uh, deeply distressing and and very disturbing feature of Ebola, but also means it it's harder to spread because cases that have passed away are not as likely to spread, although there's certainly um, around safe and dignified burials, some some transmission risk there, which is why there's such an emphasis on, on that practice in Ebola. But what's unique about uh, COVID, I think, is just a lack, you know, we don't have any immunity in the community, and um, at the same time, we don't have a vaccine. And so Ebola, after many, many years of work, we we're super fortunate that eventually we had a breakthrough around the vaccine, and so a big part of Ebola, um, outbreak management is is having this multi-pillared approach of communications, of infection prevention control, and then also of the vaccine team and epidemiology and contact tracing. And many of those same lessons and pillars are applicable in COVID and our COVID response, but the difficulty is we, we're missing a core pillar, which is vaccine distribution because we don't have a vaccine yet. And so as difficult as it is to um, to watch uh, our politicians and others sort of cage their bets around when we can return to normal. I think many of us who've worked in infectious disease outbreaks before are not so surprised to hear that we won't be having a return to normal for a year, a year and a half, two years, because that's just the horizon for most new, I mean, even that's a very tight horizon for a vaccine. And, and I think that that's what's really unprecedented. Um, I was just catching up on on some of the literature with uh, who Afro colleagues um, earlier today, and but also realizing as much as as much as this very much is is a pandemic and meets that definition of being in every corner in the world, um, there is some emerging literature about you know how Africa has not been hit as as much as we thought it might be, and that's both because I think there is a lot of experience dealing with um, these types of outbreaks in the continent. There's also you know, environmental factors that might be helpful for them. Um, but there's also been a very quick lockdown and, and, and a ton of, um, I think, experience. And to me, it's one of, I think, the most beautiful opportunities of this outbreak is that it's sort of shining a light, I think, on the flaws of the very colonial sort of Western imperialistic approach to global health and the idea that that knowledge and expertise is, is centered in the West and I certainly felt very privileged to work in Africa and come away thinking, wow, there are so many lessons here that we need to learn in Canada, in the US. And I've always been kind of struck that, um, particularly, no disrespect to American colleagues, but that they're, you know, don't necessarily have universal health care in their own country. There's a lot of work to be done there. And then there's also um, this sort of, sort of assumption that they are the experts in everything and I think this a lot of, of scholars from from the continent have been really disputing that and saying this is finally shining a light on those these inequities that are both um, in academia but also in um, practice. It is the, the pandemics you know change society because they come in on the blind spots and even looking at the World Health Organization's um, uh, uh, standards are on, on readiness for pandemics. The U.S. was rated quite highly. Mm -hmm. and that certainly uh, isn't going to be the case afterwards because you definitely see uh, the blind spots in, in systems just like uh, here around uh, uh, seniors care facilities, privatized models that, that come into place. You know, here in, in Vancouver, we already had a, a public health emergency declared around uh, related to fentanyl and, and overdose deaths. Uh, we've had uh, also vulnerable communities that 
are disproportionately uh, affected when something like COVID-19 uh, happens. And I'm uh, wondering if you can speak just a, a little bit about, um, you know, how um, uh, the spread of COVID-19 and approaches particularly around inner city uh, neighborhoods uh, 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 have been uh, uh, approached given the complex challenges there. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly been um, a unique focus in Canada around our, our focus on um, health equity and working with marginalized populations. And we've seen that, I think, some national leadership that, on that and certainly provincial leadership in British Columbia and ha have been very fortunate to have been a bit a small part of that response, um, working primarily with Vancouver Coastal Health. And that, that team there has really put um, a major emphasis on, I think, their three-pillared approach for working with inner cities, and that's been primarily around testing. So even when we um, didn't have broad access to testing because of... Uh, the lack of lab capacity there always was a major emphasis on testing in shelters because we know that people who have to live in congregate settings because of our homelessness crisis which is sort of a third component overdose crisis and then our homelessness crisis has meant that and those people are extremely vulnerable we know from the u.s context you know some shelters in california where there's been you know major outbreaks you know 60 people um, testing positive in one shelter if you're if with covid we know it spreads really easily among household contacts and if your home is a 70 bed shelter 100 bed shelter that's uh, that's a potential for a lot of transmission and so early on in this pandemic, um, we focused on testing. And then the second aspect was contact tracing. And really, um, a lot of COVID is about test and trace. And so by focusing on contacts and really uh, when there was cases in any congregate uh, living situations, immediately isolating those cases, getting them to um, a hotel. And so BC Housing and others invested in a large scale up of um, hotels, which weren't be being used because of the lack of tourism. And we were able to get people um, into a safe environment where they had their own room and their own washroom. And then the third, third aspect of, of support, and that has really been about addressing um, some of the underlying causes of the overdose crisis, which has been um, pandemic prescribing is what we're calling it. So a safe supply to um, replace street drugs so that people who are at risk of COVID aren't having to go out and engage with dealers and continue to purchase. And so if they've been asked to self-isolate, we thought it was um, only fair to give them the tools that they needed to, to isolate safely. Uh, and that meant um, giving them pharmaceutical replacement for uh, for their drugs, whether those were stimulants or opioids, alcohol, uh, cannabis, even tobacco. And that I think has been where BC has been a big leader. It's something uh, many of us have been wanting for a long time. Um, you know, really replacing um, the criminal approach to uh, drug use with a public health approach one that recognizes that um, the roots of addiction are complex and that they many times are rooted in trauma and that uh, simply wishing people would stop using drugs and not addressing the underlying determinants of their drug use, their trauma, their homelessness, their, um, you know, mental health, underlying mental health conditions while asking them to continue to hustle, to have to steal or, or, or um, engage in survival sex work. And then on top of all that, have time to get healthy. That just doesn't work in my experience as a nurse. And so um, we, we're seeing really great early success with our safe supply guidance and hoping that, um, that it's something that will, will continue after the pandemic. I know that's uh, what, what everyone's hoping for. And so we're just sort of building that evidence base on that. And, and uh, Megan, uh, with the international uh, work you've done, both with the World Health Organization and certainly in the academic work that you do, looking at the way different nation states and regions have uh, dealt with uh, the response to COVID-19, uh, what are some of your thoughts and reflections in terms of uh, international health systems or even national ones in terms of uh, preparedness for uh, pandemics? In, in, in some sense, there's almost more preparedness being done in this region on earthquakes than there is for pandemics mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I, I think obviously uh, these things come in blind spots, very easy to do sort of hindsight 2020 
uh, Monday morning quarterback. Mm -hmm. I think it's also, uh, it'd be interesting to get your read on um, what you think are some of the critiques of the broader health systems at play. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, we are such a large country that it's hard. I mean, many of the regions where they do this really well um, are uh, geographically a lot tighter and smaller, um, although we have a really small population compared to many of um, many of their big cities globally and, uh, and big nations. Uh, but I do think, so it's sort of, there's a lot, Canada's quite, a, quite unique, I think, that way and how dispersed we are. Um, but one of the big things I think is difficult for us is having a really well-funded uh, national public health system um, with a lot of support behind it and one that's really well-coordinated. And that's, that's one thing I've certainly learned from my time working with Global Fund and AIDS, TB, and malaria and uh, with WHO is that, um, you know, to really coordinate well on whether it's... Uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, supplies, um, whether it's access to essential medicines and supply chain, um, whether it's to really understand what's going on nationally with contact tracing or testing, you need a very strong uh, coordinated response. And I think for how dispersed, how, given that health is a provincial responsibility, that's often been a real challenge. Um, for for the Public Health Agency of Canada, and it's um, it's certainly something I think that everyone is really well aware of. Um, it's National Nursing Week this this week, uh, and would be remiss not to also mention we don't we're one of the only Western nations that doesn't have a chief nursing officer. For instance, we have a, a chief PHO, Dr. Teresa Tam, who's done um, some really wonderful work, but would also want to plug that that's, a, I think, a real gap that we don't have a strong national nursing voice and that public health may be in Canada, from my vantage point, hasn't been as interdisciplinary as it could be. It's uh, very physician driven here compared to many other regions I've worked in. And of course, the physician voice is really important. But um, what we've learned from Ebola is that you need social scientists. Um, you need communications experts. You need social media experts. Um, I think that's that's one of the things I've seen missing from our response compared to other countries is really understanding that crucial role of, you know, uh, the impact of COVID or other pandemics on gender and gender-based violence, um, you know, to really understand that you need all of those key disciplines at the table. You need uh, social work, nursing, um, and here I think that as, as we look back and, and have the opportunity to understand what went well and what didn't, I think um, I continue to see task forces being announced that have really just one or two disciplines in them. And that's unusual in my experience to, to how other countries are um, addressing large pandemics, especially ones that have the experience we had in Ebola where we, we realized that our communications weren't working and that that was actually leading to um, making the conflict worse running Ebola and DRC in the middle of a, of a conflict setting became very clear that we had to address rumors and myths and take them very seriously and get very sophisticated about how we addressed uh, social media myth making in in that uh, outbreak. Uh, you know with um, uh, the sort of lessons of the 20th century pandemics be it uh, 1918 to 20 or 56-57 the ones from 68 to 70, there's uh, certainly some ways we can read into the, the present moment. But of course, I think as with most pandemics, you can't really look that far into the future. We don't mm -hmm. know what the fall and the spring are looking like. It really puts a lot of uh, planning into disarray. And as we start moving into uh, opening up uh, to some degree uh, here in BC, universities are deciding whether to open up or not. And, uh, you know, from a, a health perspective, of course, uh, one thing that we know is that we don't know what's going to happen. But what are, from a health perspective, what are things that people are going to be looking for in terms of indicators and uh, other developments that will help uh, make sense of uh, of, of uh, what uh, what some kind of normal will look like or what kind of new normal will come to be? Yeah, I mean, I think it, certainly most pandemics in history have had a second wave. And so we talk a lot about that in, in public health and you, and you do here nationally and provincially, Dr. Bonnie Henry, um, who's done some amazing leadership in BC, talking about we really do expect a second wave that could be as early as this fall. It could 
be later. And so I think many of us are bracing for that and, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best is a very a classic adage, but it, it's certainly the case in outbreak response. Um, and, I, and the system here, I think, has, is really keeping, um, we're trying to keep staff, keep everybody at the ready, because we anticipate that while we may have a lull in the summer, things could certainly pick up again. Um, in terms of uh, what, how people are using this time, I think globally, uh, and certainly in Europe, speaking to colleagues there as well, is preparing and, and really looking, taking a deep dive to understand what the unintended consequences have been to the sort of intensive lockdown um, that many countries have taken in, have and the lockdown measures countries have implemented. And so there's some really interesting work happening now with economists and um, other disciplines on on figuring out really, you know, health is, is, uh, is about so much more than just the body. It's about the determinants of health. And so we know that job losses um, and loss of income and uh, even uh, feelings of isolation impact different, different communities differently. And the less privilege you have, the more likely these are to impact you. Uh, and we also know I'm particularly passionate about the lot of pre- precarious workers and people with precarious employment and how difficult that is, how easy it is to say, you know, stay home, but how difficult that is if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you know that your employer isn't going to support you to stay home. And so um, I think now is the perfect time to prepare for for, and to understand what those unintended consequences are and how we can really create a livable wage for people. That means that, and that people have, you know, essential policies like, um, there's there is punishment if you are not allowed to stay home sick there are consequences for employers that don't respect that um, that there be genuine acceptance of people needing to stay home and then there be child care um, from a gender perspective I know it's been really difficult for me I have two kids um, and I've been working full-time on the BC pandemic response as a nurse and uh the idea that I can homeschool my child with ADHD is laughable. <laughs> and he, you know, we, my husband is also an essential service worker. So um, it really impacts children um, with disabilities differently. And especially the children of essential workers, whether you're a grocery store clerk, a nurse, a bus driver, all of us are trying to do our best. And, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping that as we move into the fall, that we start to realize that, you know, different families will need different approaches and that we, um, we learn from, from uh, the sort of last eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, uh, Megan, in terms of uh, uh, international institutions like the World uh, Health Organization, they've both um, come under criticism for not acting quickly enough, uh, just like a lot of international uh, organizations like the UN, they're made up of member states, there's politics at play, there's a lack of resources oftentimes. But if there were some uh, recommendations that you would have around uh, how we can rebuild trust with international institutions and also to have them do what they need to do uh, to help um, uh, 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 getting a sense uh, very early on when a pandemic is arising and for them to be able to work well, uh, what um, ought to be in place or what does COVID-19 uh, perhaps uh, show us about the weakness of some of these uh, systems that are in place? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a really great question. I mean, I'm not on the, perhaps acknowledging my bias as <laughs> someone that's worked directly for WHO, uh, I definitely don't um, subscribe to, you know, President Trump's comments around uh, the, the sort of uselessness of it. I don't think that's backed up by fact. I, facts. I think um, Dr. Tedros and others sounded the alarm really loudly. I think sometimes, again, it, it goes back to my point about communications. Um, when you starve an organization, that organization is is very famously underfunded. It's really difficult for it to do the work that it needs to do to be effective, especially when you're um, pushing against this tide of very well-funded and well-financed um, alternative narratives in the media. 
whether that be, uh, I think someone, some scholars recently published a, a paper that, you know, some of the conspiracy websites get like 45 million hits in a day and WHO gets 6 million. And you just, that kind of, the massive funding of troll networks and, and sort of that, those, these bad actors. Uh, I think sometimes people in public health are quite naive about how that impacts our work. And certainly um, you don't have to look too far to sort of um, the impact on elections globally to understand the, how well financed and resourced those, uh, those bad actors are and how difficult and important and crucial it is that we not be naive about that and that we resource our response and that we address um, these, these attacks on democracy. And, and WHO, has, certainly there's many um, smarter political scientists and, and uh, public health scholars than me that have written about, you know, ways to reform WHO. And, and um, I know my colleague at LSHTM, um, Peter Piot, recently, who just recovered from COVID himself, talks about some of his ideas for reform, among others. I think it's no secret or, uh, that many people wish that WHO had a little bit of stronger um, power. It's made up of its member states and it has to uh, be involved in, in politics because that's how diplomacy works. And there's good and bad things about that, having the work for the Red Cross as well. You know, you have your MSF, your Doctors Without Borders approach of témoignage where you um, speak truth to power and that's something in my activist days certainly did more of but I've also learned that there's you can get a lot done um, working behind the scenes as well and there's a lot that WHO is doing that they can't necessarily talk about and that's that's their role to be that sort of health diplomat um, and then to have actors like MSF and others being the stronger voice of voices and I think you need both it's not an either or and it's not true that um, one system is better and the Red Cross's principle of neutrality um, has them sort of in a very different place, uh, a, a neutral role that comes from their role um, after the war. Uh, and being that's why they're able to work in prisons, why they're able to work in refugee camps and in conflicts in many ways, because they maintain that position of neutrality. And so this, this is something at COVID in the context of conflict is, is another um, really interesting area that people are really now starting to turn to and how do we address COVID? There's been global calls for ceasefires. The U.S. has not joined that. Um, so I think this, as, as things sort of quiet down, it's going to be interesting to see if con conflicts start to rear their heads further, um, how, how we handle that as a, as, as really that'll be the UN family working on that together with member states. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Below the Radar, and, and thank you for all the uh, amazing work that you've been doing, and uh, uh, best wishes, and, and I realize it's going to be a long haul, uh, as you said, and, uh, and hopefully we all get through this together. Thanks. See you, neighbor. <laughs> Take care.